two years. So welcome everyone. My name's Julie Highfield. I'm the Director of Wellbeing for the Intensive Care Society and an ICU clinical psychologist. And I'm really, really pleased to present to you and, and chair for you this morning, the latest in our Thriving at Work webinars. And this is about psychological impacts of, of the pandemic on staff, but looking at some key areas of research and some updates on those. So I am delighted by my panel this morning. So far an all-female panel, but we do have a gentleman joining us later when he catches his train. So this is the plan for this morning. So first of all, you're going to hear about the Candid study, and that's about critical care and redeployed nurses, the impact of COVID-19 on work-related stress. And I was delighted to actually, in part of my NHS role, uh, uh, contribute to the, towards this in a very small way in terms of participants. So we have the wonderful Professor Diane Dixon. She's a professor of health psychology, and she is just at the moment moving from University of um, Aberdeen to Edinburgh and Napier. Joining her is Dr Janice Rattray, Honorary Reader in the School of Health Sciences at the University of Dundee. So we'll be hearing from them first and then moving on at 10 o'clock we'll be uh, hearing from games, which is a brief gameplay intervention to help intrusive memories as a result of working clinically during the pandemic. Another one that I've been involved in, but this time through my intensive care society role. So I'm delighted that we're joined with the very, uh, that we're joined this morning with the very lovely Professor Emily Holmes, who's a professor at Uppsala University, Sweden, and Dr. Lali Ayardo. I, oh, I knew I wouldn't pronounce it right. I Ayadurai, Senior Le uh, Research Clinical Psychologist in the study. Um, and she will correct me and say her name even better later this morning. Apologies, Lally. And then joining us a little bit later on uh, will be Professor Neil Greenberg, who's going to talk about two aspects of research. So he's been looking at a longitudinal study of mental health of staff working in um, I see you during these times, but also widening it out to his research on moral distress and injury. Uh, professor Greenberg is a professor of defence medicine and is a clinical academic psychiatrist based at King's College in London. So I am going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand over to Diane and Janice, who are going to share their results of Candid. So over to you, Diane and Janice. Thank you. First of all, thanks to the ICS for um, inviting us to present the results of our study and to do the proposed study. I'm Janice Rattray, as Julie said, from the University of Dundee, and I'll start the, the presentation and my colleague Diane Dixon will pick up as we go through. Do you want to just move on, Diane? trying to do that, Janice. You'll have to bear with us. We, we're novice webinars. I didn't actually, I didn't. I, uh. Okay, so what's candid about? We started off um, by being particularly interested in the consequences for critical care nurses uh, of work-related stress as a result of working through COVID-19. Uh, and we were able to base our, our study on the work of Louise McCallum from the University of Glasgow. Louise was a PhD student of mine and had looked at work-related stress and critical care nurses pre-pandemic. So we were able to have, in a very fortunate position, of having comparative data, data from before the pandemic. We extended it slightly to include redeployed nurses um, because the literature was also saying that redeployed nurses were at risk uh, of negative consequences of working in critical care during the pandemic. So we were interested in the consequences for them. But we also appreciated and realised that, that it's not just about work-related stress, it's the whole environment, um, both negative and positive, uh, the effects that it can have on individuals. And today, this is the, the results we're going to present of critical care nurses, not the redeployed, uh, and the results of the uh, comparative work. 
You have also wanted to, again, extend the study and gain a better in-depth understanding of the experiences of critical care nurses and redeployed. And we were aware that many boards and trusts were implementing a range of supportive measures to try to support nurses during this. So we were interested in the perceived effectiveness of identifying any gaps. And to do this, um, we created a mixed method study, uh, and it's the phase one that we're going to present today. Uh, and this was quite an extensive survey based on Louise's work um, that we distributed across health boards in Scotland. We also included two English NHS Trust and one Welsh NHS board. Uh, our inclusion criteria for critical care nurses and redeployed were those with substantive contracts. For the redeployed, they had to have been redeployed into critical care for at least two shifts. Phase two involved one-to-one -one interviews. So when we sent out the surveys, we invited people to take part in our interviews. Uh, we had a consent to contact um, forum within the, the survey pack. So we were able to interview 30 critical care nurses and 15 redeployed. Our survey results we compared with the 2018 pre-COVID survey, and that was a Scotland-wide survey. So that was 11 NHS boards. Now, because this was based on a PhD study, of course, this theoretical framework underpinned it. And we use the job demand resource model. Uh, and this model suggests that, our, that job demands, and job demands can be divided into physical, emotional, cognitive, uh, can affect a person's health. So increased job demands could lead to poorer health impairment. Uh, and health impairment for us was burnout, it was post-traumatic stress symptoms, and it was psychological distress uh, in the main. This model also has a positive pathway. So it's a dual process model, with the negative pathway being the relationship between job demands and health impairment, the positive pathway being job resources and how well a person is supported uh, within the work environment, and that would, how that leads to improved work engagement. The resources are not just about job resources, they're also about personal resources. And for us, this was about resilience. Uh, and I know that resilience is something that can be misused um, within all organisations. But for us, resilience was about the interaction for a person within the work environment. Uh, and the work environment can either promote resilience or it can deplete. But the effect on the individual of health or work engagement can also have an effect or can alter organisational outcomes. So how a person is supported at work, what demands they have, will affect them as an individual, but then potentially will also affect the organisational outcomes. So we measured a range of organisational outcomes uh, that included um, that in included. Uh, Sorry, I've been distracted from a bleep. Uh, that in included job satisfaction, that included commitment, that included patient safety, uh, and also quality of care. This model allows for a, a number of interactions to be tested, uh, and the effect of resources on someone, an individual's health, uh, is also able to be um, is also able to be tested, and we were able to do that. So this is our underpinning theoretical model. Now, our participants, this gives you the, the breakdown of the number of, of nurses that we recruited. Uh, and we needed to ensure that there were between group equivalents so that we could compare two groups and there were. Just give you a minute to look at it, but you'll see that the, there was little difference. And certainly the statistics. So I'm going to hand over to Diane, and she's going to take you through our results. Morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to start with that positive, uh, the negative arm uh, that Janice just presented um, 
from the JDR model. So this slide is showing you the measures of health impairment that we had in Candid and the job demands that we measured as potential sources of health impairment. So we have three main um, measures of psychological distress. We have the GHQ12 measuring mental health, the mass life burnout inventory um, measuring burnout and the three components of, of burnout. So emotional exhaustion, accomplishment and depersonalization. And we have the PCL5 as a measure of symptoms of post-traumatic stress. Um, we only have the PCL5 in the pandemic survey. We didn't have that measure in the 2018 survey. I and mean, we included it because when we were develop, as we were developing the survey, evidence was beginning to emerge in the literature that um, it would be pertinent for us to measure symptoms of post-traumatic stress because that was emerging in the literature. And we have a couple of other indicators of stress. The GHQ, the MBI and the PCL5, none of them are diagnostic measures, but each of them has a threshold level um, which indicates probable um, caseness. So we can have a look at elevation in risk using those threshold levels too. And we had 10 um, indicators of job demands, 10 different types of job demands, one of which uh, the communication with relatives. Again, we only had that in the pandemic sample um, and um, because communication, uh, communi there were clear issues around and challenges for staff around communicating with relatives um, remotely as they were uh, required to do during the pandemic. So if we look first at the levels, um, generally on this graph, a higher score is worse impairment. The uh, exception to that is the accomplishment subscale of burnout, where a lower score indicates worse impairment. The pandemic data are always shown in red on the graphs and the 2018 data are always shown in green. And you can see just by eyeballing this data that um, the, the pandemic has had a negative impact on health impairment, regardless of how we measure health impairment. So mental health is worse. Um, Nurses are uh, showing greater emotional exhaustion, reduced accomplishments, um, increased uh, sense of depersonalization. Uh, we can't comment on the change in PTSD symptoms because we didn't have that measure in 2018. But basically across the board, um, health, um, mental health has um, been negatively affected uh, by the pandemic. And we're looking at some quite large um, effect sizes within the data. If we then look at the risk of reaching that threshold for probable um, caseness, we can see that, again, just eyeballing the data, that um, the risk is elevated, regardless of the measure of impairment that we have. And if we put the odds ratios on those data, you'll see that they, the data are quite stark. So staff were experiencing a six-fold increase in risk of reaching threshold for psychological distress on the GHQ-12. And you can see those are quite um, significant and dramatic odds ratios, um, really, regardless of our measure. We can't, of course, comment, give you an odds ratio for PTSD symptoms or symptoms of post-traumatic stress. But just for a bit of context, um, if you look at the prevalence of PTSD, so the, the, the diagnosis of PTSD, that sits around 10% in what we thought were interesting job categories to look at. So ambulance workers and rescue workers, both of whom, and, um, both of whom encounter um, traumatic situations as part of their role, the, the, the prevalence rates of diagnosed PTSD are around 10%. 30% of our sample were reaching the threshold on the PCL5 for probable PTSD. But again, I emphasize we don't have, these are not diagnostic instruments, but they're clearly indicating um, uh, causes for concern across the board in terms of psychological health for staff. If we then look at job demands, again, you'll see that they're elevated. Um, uh, so we've got five job demands that increased during the pandemic. Uh, three for which there were no difference, and then visitor expectations, that was a, a lower demand during the pandemic for pretty obvious reasons, because there weren't any visitors to ICU during the pandemic. 
you can see here just looking at so that the the demands that were high pre pandemic were also high during the pandemic so mental load is a significant demand for nurses working in ICU and that remained the case during the pandemic, but you can see that there are um, increases in job demands. Um, around pace and amount of work, emotional load, the complexity of the work, um, the organization and um, role conflict were all elevated. And whilst some of the individual effect sizes are quite modest, of course, nurses will experience those job demands kind of in total. Um, but here we're just looking at the increases in those individual demands. So if we look at predictors of health impairment, there's a lot of data in Candid. So really here, what we've done is we've, shown, we've got um, a table where we're looking at the impact on three measures of health impairment. So the GHQ12, the emotional exhaustion component of the MBI and the PCL5. And here a, a darker color is indicating um, a stronger association. So it just get, it gives you um, uh, perhaps an easier access to the data. And you'll see that for health impairment, there are demographic factors that are predictive and, it, and these factors are um, protective. So if you have uh, more experience, you're on a higher band and if you've got childcare responsibilities, then you're reporting fewer, P are you scoring, scoring lower on the PCL5? Childcare responsibilities are also protective in relation to emotional um, exhaustion. But you'll see that there are job demands and there are job resources and personal resources that are predictive of each of the health outcomes. Of particular note is increased emotional load, which you saw in a strong association with all three outcomes. And again, if you go move your eyes all the way down to the bottom of this table, the personal resource of resilience, so depleted resilience, it has a strong association with scores on the GHQ, emotional exhaustion, and um, symptoms of post-traumatic stress. And the very bottom row on this table shown in gray is giving you an indication of how well the predictors um, explain the variability in each of the three outcomes. So we're over 50% of the variability in emotional exhaustion is explained by um, a, this, this variety of predictors. So the model um, is able to predict health impairment and there's some um, predictive utility and demographic characteristics of the sample job demands and um, both job and personal resources. If we now move on to that positive uh, portion of the JDR model, this is work engagement, and we have three measures of work engagement, and we have a variety of job resources. And as Janice said, um, we operationalize personal resources in terms of resilience, which is that interaction between the person and their job environment. So if we begin again, looking at just at levels of work engagement and here a higher score is better engagement. And you can see that work engagement is reduced during the pandemic. Um, and that's the case across all three components of um, work engagement. So lower vigor, lower dedication and um, lower absorption. So a negative impact on work engagement. And if we look at the personal job resources experienced by nurses during the pandemic, again, we can see some uh, negative impacts. So there are eight resources that were um, depleted during the pandemic. So on this graph, higher is fewer, lower resources. So we have eight that were depleted. Uh, resilience, so that personal resource uh, was impacted by the pandemic. And then we've got three resources, so feedback, autonomy, and task clarity, that for critical care nurses were not impacted by the pandemic. So again, we've got nurses who are experiencing um, reduced uh, job and personal resources um, whilst they were working during the pandemic. So if you look at predictors of work engagement, again, we're accounting for around a third of the variability in engagement and nurses were more engaged if they perceived that the organization valued the quality of their work. So that was still prioritized by the organization. If they were provided with learning opportunities, which were depleted actually during the pandemic, but um, nurses were more engaged if they um, experienced opportunities to learn in their work and if their resilience had not been uh, depleted. 
And just moving over to those final organizational outcomes, and again, I'll speak about levels and predictors of organizational outcomes. We measured six of them. Um, so this is the levels. And again, we've got some slight difference in scoring here. So in general, a higher score is a worse outcome, the exceptions being perceptions of patient safety and quality of care, where um, a higher score is a better outcome. So you'll see that we've got a negative impact of working in the pandemic on each of the organizational outcomes that we measured. So nurses were less satisfied with their work. They were less certain about their future um, working for that organization, in this case, the NHS. And they, they were showing um, a greater, they were thinking about changing their jobs in the next um, 12 months. They perceived that patient safety had reduced and the quality of care was lower during the pandemic. So again, quite significant negative organizational um, outcomes during the pandemic compared to what life was like in 2018. And again, if we look at predictors, and this is the same, um, um, what we've done here is the same as on the impairment um, data. So a stronger color is indicating, um, uh, a sorry, a deeper color is indicating a stronger association between a predictor and organizational outcome. And you'll see here that none of the demographic factors were predictive of organizational uh, outcomes. Rather, it was demands, resources, um, the impact on health and work engagement that were, that were predictive. And I think you can take just, again, just looking at the intensity of the color and the presence of color on this table, job resources seem to be uh, particularly important in relation to organizational um, outcomes. So if there were fewer learning uh, opportunities, staff had got, like they were less certain about their future and they perceived a greater reduction in patient safety and quality of care. Um, so job resources and um, health impairment and, and uh, components of work engagement are particularly important in relation to organizational outcomes, but especially job resources and the impact on um, psychological health um, are important in relation to organizational outcomes. And now I'm gonna hand you back to Janice, who's going to speak about some of the more qualitative data that we collected as part of the survey. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Di. At the end of this fairly lengthy questionnaire, and it was a lengthy questionnaire, we asked a number of open-ended questions. We asked people to describe, just use words to describe their worst shift, words to describe their best shift, and words, anything else they'd like to tell us. And what we'd like to do today is just give you a couple of slides with the words that people used to describe their worst and best shifts. And <clears throat> when we were looking at this data, because it was a fairly lengthy question, our expectations were that this would not be completed particularly well. However, uh, we were kind of blown away with the number of responses uh, and the words that were used. And, and when we presented this material to, to a couple of stakeholder groups, I, I've said that it comes with a bit of a health warning. Uh, so I'll just go through to present um, these words. Okay, Di.
So to sum up, I think you'll that we think the study has shown that uh, critical care nurses reported elevated levels of health impairment in everything that was measured. Particularly of concern uh, is the psychological distress, but measured by the GHQ-12, six times more likely to hit these thresholds. Post-traumatic stress symptoms are higher than other relatively comparable occupational groups. And, and the worry here is that Post-traumatic stress symptoms can be enduring and can, can cause functional impairment. The issue of burnout being significantly different, particularly around emotional exhaustion, is also concerning. Burning can, burnout can be enduring, but it's also contagious, so prevalence is likely to increase. I think we were quite surprised, in a way, uh, around the role of job resources. Uh, and the impact of the poorer job resources on both health and health impairment and work engagement was, was quite stark for us. The model that we used seemed to work quite well because it did follow what the model suggests, that when job demands are high, health impairment is poorer. When job, res when job resources are high, work engagement is better. And lack of job resources was a more consistent predictor of work organisational outcomes. And, and I think for us, the sense of how organisations support staff should not be at all underestimated. We haven't presented any qualitative findings, but these do align very well with our quantitative results and illustrate the challenges and the emotional burden of working through this pandemic. So the group was, was multidisciplinary, um, uh, and these are the other co-investigators. So we had a consultant psychiatrist who had a, a practicing critical care nurse, uh, and we had previous critical care nurses. And finally, we'd like to thank those that helped us. Within every unit that we recruited from, we had a unit contact. We couldn't have done this study without them. And the other people we'd like to thank is nursing. Uh, we had approached a number of uh, organisations to ask if they would help us with planking the units, and nursing provided a significant amount of their hand that we were able to distribute. Thanks very much for listening. If you want to contact either of us uh, for any additional information, our contact details are there on the screen. Fabulous. Thank you both so very much. Um, just to say to the audience that we're encouraging you to put questions into the Q&A function and we'll have a Q&A at the end. But just firstly, a brief question from me. Um, it's really great to see that presented again. I had a sneak preview before Christmas. Um, do we have a sense of when um, this we may be able to get this um, in paper format uh, when the publications are going to follow? We're trying. <laughs> so it's yeah, we're trying. We we've actually you can you can get the critical care nurse analyses on Med Archive. So if people just search Dixon Rattray Candid, they'll get the protocol paper in the BMJ. But we put it up on Med Archive just so that people can access that whilst the peer review process does its work. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely fabulous ladies thank you so much we'll hear a bit more from you later and have a bit more of a discussion uh, but now i want to hand over to emily and lali who are going to present on their work thank you julie and um just thank you so much to diane and janice for a fantastic talk and um such an important study um and we're honoured to follow on the back of that with um, some work that Lally and I have been uh, working on. So Lally, I'll, I'll share my screen now and then we'll introduce a bit further. Okay, so here you go. Can you see it all right? Yes, that's perfect. Lovely. Oops. Um, um, so we're going to be talking about 
one piece of, of, of this bigger puzzle and challenge that, that lies ahead um, of the impact of working in the pandemic on staff. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is a, a study called GAINS, um, which is about an intervention for one piece. And the piece that we're looking at is intrusive memories. But the hope is it may allow us to have a discussion about the impact of looking at this piece and other sorts of pieces that, um, that Janice and Diane have talked about today. Um, so I want to start just by saying thank you very much to Julie um, for uh, hosting this uh, in the Thriving at Work series to our fellow co-panelists too. And a really big shout out and thank you to our study team, which includes Julie here and fantastic set of um, uh, researchers. Uh, you can see some of their pictures and my long-term uh, dear collaborator and colleague, Lali Yadre, who's be giving the second half of this talk. Um, we're particularly grateful to our collaborating partner, the Intensive Care Society, have been fundamental in our direction of travel, uh, the rationale for what we do and helping us do it in the way we do, and uh, grateful to funding from the Wellcome Trust study for the randomized control trial. So these are my disclosures um, and Lally's. Um, and here's um, just a picture of one of the um, actually recruitment material um, visuals that um, the Intensive Care Society very kindly helped us with and prepare to, to kind of introduce the study. And the idea really that um, this was a study um, aiming to support NHS staff who'd experienced stressful or psychologically traumatic events whilst working during the COVID-19 pandemic. And in the slides we've just seen, I think Janice and Diana put up these examples of worse shifts and the word traumatic came up there. And I guess in, in um, it, here in this context of traumatic, we mean events where people experience or witness severe injury, death or dying, um, um, or learn about it. So I think covers a lot of, uh, of these work incidences. Um, and in this first study, this is working with people who uh, were working in intensive care, this intensivists. Um, and the intervention approach is going to be one brief task, and I'll get, get on to that in a moment. So we've just started a second study as well, a follow-up study. And I'm going to I'll put up this slide at the very end of the talk, but we just wanted to put it up now. If any of you in the audience know people who may be interested in taking part, who have intrusive memories from working um, of trauma, from working the pandemic, because we will be recruiting between now and March. And you can find this hosted on the ICS wellbeing pages uh, and the ICS Twitter, but also our own study website, uh, www.p1vital.gains.com. So the pandemic has shone a spotlight on the issue of work-related traumatic events for healthcare staff globally. Um, very early on in the pandemic, um, we had the privilege of working in the Academy of Medical Sciences in the UK um, and MQ and others um, flagged actually within the first month of the pandemic concern and highlights that have just been um, underscored by Janice and Diane's data on uh, what, what groups may be most vulnerable to um, stress-related uh, symptoms in a pandemic. And, um, Healthcare staff were flagged as very high risk. This is work in Lancet Psychiatry, published within um, in April of the pan uh, pandemic. Um, and this is the work that we just found your paper, actually, we read it on Med Archive, um, uh, Janice and Diane. So um, um, around the issue about um, this, I mean, it's a massive increase, six-fold increase in symptoms, so higher work burnout and lower work engagement. Um, in critical care nurses compared to previously. Um, and Greenberg, who's the, the speaker after us, also sort of had flagged during the pandemic about the increase uh, within this uh, of so-called uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Um, um, here, for example, data on the 2021 winter surge, um, reaching high portions. And I think what Janice and Dan pointed out was just contextualize it. So, when we're talking about these high levels of symptoms and you, you saw the, the benchmarking against um, other uh, occupational staff and the general population, you can see these are really 
staggeringly high numbers uh, of impairment, um, higher than perhaps we'd see in the military, for example. So what we've been focusing on is one piece of this much bigger puzzle. And, um, and I'm gonna to talk to you now about intrusive memories of traumatic events. Like what is it that happens psychologically in someone's mind for some people after they've experienced severe injury, uh, death or dying. And the hypothesis is focusing on one thing here, intrusive memories could be useful in its own right, um, just because one might, may not wish to have intrusive memories. But sometimes by focusing on one piece of the puzzle, as we know from other areas of healthcare, um, can also have downstream benefits for other types of difficulties and the kind of things the panel's discussing today. And we'll show you some data on that. So what are intrusive memories? What do we mean by that term in psychology? Well, what we mean is recurrent memories that pop into your mind when you don't want them to. Um, and they're sensory, so they're not words and thoughts. They're more like visual images sights and sounds. So it's like seeing the patient in the bed again, or hearing and seeing the mother screaming. Yeah. And then the moment. So if you think about the, the kind of worst shift thing, it's like it would be a visualization, a replay of that event again and again and again um, in the mind's eye. And they tend to be quite vivid, emotional, hijack attention. They can be distressing in their own right. They're also a core symptom um, they, um, of post-traumatic stress disorder, or they could be subclinical. They also can be a precursor to developing post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and they can disrupt functioning. And what do I mean by disrupting functioning? Well, I mean, these things are clearly distressing psychologically, but if you um, think about how they arise, they're often triggered by cues in the environment. So if you're having a, um, a visual image replaying again uh, of a moment where something awful happened during care, for example, the top image, um, that image may be triggered by very simple perceptual cues, like seeing another side of a bed or another curtain on the ward. So that means that the work environment can be the very environment that triggers the occurrence of these memories. But to have a brief intrusive moment, and all of us will have intrusive moments at some point, it could be from the news, it could be from other events in our lives, just in that moment, that's also very disrupting. So that can disrupt concentration and put us back in time to somewhere where we, where we weren't. So um, that, that's why these, these fragments of memory can have a profound impact for some of us on functioning. So over a number of years, we've been looking at um, sort of simple task-based interventions to think about, is there a way we could dampen down the impact of these memories and help um, improve um, them for, for people? And what we're gonna talk about now is something that's um, quite brief. Uh, the intervention we've tested in this, in this is only uh, involves one hour with Lally, for example, or one of her team. Um, and then you can zap, as it were, one interest memory at a time, it takes about 25 minutes per session. And once someone's learned to do it with Lally, they can do it in their own time whenever they want. So you can be flexible around work schedules, you don't need to schedule to go and see somebody. Uh, it's, it's a task-based self-management tool rather than a talking therapy. Um, and you don't have to discuss the trauma in detail. And, and just to flag, this is coming from a sort of science perspective. We've actually worked from, from a large number of years and um, as scientists in, in the laboratory trying to think about this phenomena, which is, is unusual actually, intrusive memory, intrusive memory of very emotional events and the sorts of parameters that we can use to help dampen down the number of times those memories intrude. So I'm just flagging this up very briefly to sort of say that this isn't just coming straight out the blue, this is coming from, from more basic psychological science um, around the parameters of intrusive memories uh, here in the laboratory but also in work that Lally and I have been working together for a large number of years now, where we started to move our laboratory protocols designed to give this sort of task-based procedure, it's got three components in it, um, to people to use the things we did in the laboratory to say, could we help patients to start with in accident and emergency, waiting um, in the first few hours of a, say, severe car accident, when a traumatic uh, road traffic accident. And what we see here on the right-hand side in the graph is, on the y-axis, the number of intrusive memories in the week after they've done our intervention versus after they've done a placebo intervention or an active task control or comparator intervention. So here we've got, um, we see in this first study where we were taking it out to patients, um, a suggestion that doing this simple procedure, it took about 25 minutes, reduced the number of intrusive memories compared to an alternative procedure. That was work that was um, replicated in the hospitals here in Sweden and extended to show longer term benefits. And it was just about as we're starting our 
third study that the pandemic struck. And all this work had been done in tight collaboration with our nurse collaborators in Sweden working on the intense, um, in the emergency department. And our nurse collaborators actually were part of the drivers behind doing this work now with Julie in the ICS because they said, well, if this is for patients, we're actually a staff confronting a lot of traumatic events. Isn't this sort of thing the, thing, the kind of thing we could do for staff as well as patients? And a story that Lally was also hearing in the UK. So we switched our focus in the, in the pandemic. We started to change the intervention parameters to try and make it available in a, um, a safe way. So digitally and remotely rather than being delivered in person was the first thing we did in the pandemic to work very closely with nurse collaborators on the way we phrase things, put uh, uh, work, uh, the language we used, the graphics we used, and that early work was done in Sweden and work that we then really developed in more detail, particularly a big shout out to Julie, who you'll see in a moment for, 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 for getting that, well, obviously in English rather than Swedish, um, uh, expressing this in a way that um, we hoped we'd, we'd be able to communicate with, with those of you working in the ICU um, and learning from, from that. So the GAIN study was therefore a chance um, we had to test this as a randomized control trial and that's what I want to talk to you about in, in just a second. So by that, I mean, we're going to compare this brief intervention task uh, procedure compared to treatment as usual, as it were. Um, and about exactly what the kind of thing the Intensive Care Society and Julie's wellbeing pages have been concerned about and talked about for, for, for some time. These images that pop into your head, um, common reactions to traumatic events when you don't want them to, um, not be able to stop thinking about the interests the incident. So this very, very specific mechanistically driven piece of the puzzle rather than everything about trauma. And I want to be very clear about this, where it's this one piece that we're focused on, um, uh, not everything. So with Julie, who is part of our intervention now and presents a, a wonderful video explaining what intrusive memories are. Um, uh, and that's very important in any, I think, uh, work trying to help um, with the mental health and well-being consequences of difficulties being very clear about what the symptom is or isn't um, and how to talk about that. So intrusive memories and mental images from a tra traumatic event that pop suddenly to mind when you don't want them to. Um, um, and then I won't go into this into detail, but this is just to sort of flag up the kind of classic RCT model. We've got two groups. We get people going to be randomised either to immediate access to intervention. They meet Lally once and then they can use it by themselves for a month, or they're, they're randomized in this study to delayed access. They don't get, they get treatment as usual or wait list as it were for, for a month and then get access later to the intervention. And what's special about this is that we also very grateful to um, collaborators uh, such as Thomas Jackie um, and Charlotte Summers, because we used a, what's called a Bayesian adopted, adaptive design. So it's not a traditional RCT or frequented design, we're actually going to be monitoring the study as we're going to do as we go along. We're really, really aware that taking part in research studies takes up staff time. So we wanted to use the smallest number of participants we could. And with this new advances in trial design, uh, so-called Bayesian designs, adaptive designs, we're able to do that because we can keep testing our statistics as we go along and stop the study once we've got solid evidence, which is exactly what we did. So we um, um, actually were able to um, um, stop this trial early we thought we'd probably need about 150 people we actually stopped after 86 people randomized because as we continue to look at the study results um the burden of evidence was so overwhelmingly in favor of the intervention being helpful rather than not helpful and also not harmful that we were advised by our statisticians and trial group to do that um so i'm going to turn to lally now who's going to talk a little bit about the actual results and lally i'll forward your slides for you Thank you. Thanks, Emily. So um, I'm just going to start off with an overview of our, our participants, the group of ICU staff who took part in the study. Um, and what you can see is that we had um, a variety of different job roles, um, uh, nurses, doctors and other allied health professionals as well. Um, participants were on average just under 40 and predominantly female and a range of different ethnicities as well, um, which were overall representative of the NHS workforce. 
Um, we also looked at how many traumatic events people had experienced at baseline. So this was during the pandem pandemic, but before they came into the study. And what was really striking was that participants reported on average over 35 work-related traumas that they had already experienced during the pandemic. We also were really interested in um, how many of those people went on to have ongoing traumatic events related to their work, work during the study. Um, and what you can see here is that at four week follow up and eight week follow up, we saw really high proportion of participants, just under 50% who reported having experienced one or more new traumatic events during their work in the pandemic. So in terms of the um, Bayesian analysis results, so this is our results on the primary outcome, which was how many intrusive memories um, staff had four weeks in their fourth week after they had the guided intervention session with the researcher. So they'd had access here to the intervention for four weeks in the immediate arm compared to usual care in the delayed arm. Um, and at our final Bayesian analysis, we found really strong evidence that um, staff um, had fewer intrusive memories when they'd had access to the intervention compared to usual care. And actually we saw this result relatively early on in our um, interim analyses, and that persisted and built up in evidence during the course of the um, series of analyses. And this, um, this uh, graph here just shows you the result on the primary outcome. So how many intrusive memories um, staff had in week four. What you can see at baseline there on the left hand side is that in both groups staff had really quite strikingly high numbers of intrusive memories, um, about 14 intrusive memories over the course of a week. And just to put that into context, in order to have a diagnosis of PTSD, it only requires really having about one intrusive memory a week. So this was a group with really quite a high level of symptom burden. Um, in the delayed arm at week four, you can see that just over time, there's a slight natural um, reduction in how many intrusive memories people had. But what's um, important is that in the immediate intervention group, those who received the intervention, there was a really very significant reduction in the number of intrusive memories from about 14 down to one over the course of the week. And if you're interested in finding out more about the results of the Bayesian analyses, um, we have a preprint of our paper available on MedArchive. And so what the crossover design um, allowed us to do was to look at whether we then saw uh, a change in how many intrusive memories people in the delayed arm had after they received the intervention. And what you can see here is that at week eight, after the delayed arm received the intervention, we again see this significant drop down to um, levels of uh, intrusive memories that are approximately the same as in the immediate arm after receiving the intervention. So a striking decrease again. And we had a look at a number of different secondary outcomes in this trial, um, because as, as Emily explained, we were really interested in some of the, the kind of potential knock-on effects um, through targeting intrusive memories. So we looked at a number of different clinical symptoms. Obviously, as you as it would expect, we looked at symptoms of PTSD using the PCL. We used a shortened four item version in order to reduce burden on staff who were taking part in the study. We looked at insomnia symptoms, we looked at anxiety and depression, and here you can see that we found effects at four weeks on PTSD, insomnia and anxiety symptoms, and no effect on depression symptoms. We also were very interested in work functioning, and we've obviously heard from Janice and Diane today that um, that's something was particularly affected for people during the pandemic. Um, and here we looked at both work engagement and work bur burnout using a measure called um, the scale of work engagement and burnout, the SWEBO. We found effects at four, week on, four weeks on both, so improved work engagement and reduced work burnout in those who received the intervention versus um, those who had usual care uh, and no effect on sickness absence. 
We also looked at um, general functioning um, and quality of life. And again, we saw effects at four weeks on general functioning, quality of life, and also a measure which looked at um, uh, functional problems that participants identified themselves, the Cyclops. We um, were fortunate to work with um, a group from the University of Nottingham who supported us with running independent qualitative interviews with our participants at the end of the study. Um, and this, these interviews highlighted a number of different aspects of the intervention, uh, various positives in particular that people found the intervention very easy to use and enjoyable, um, and a few advantages relative to um, other types of uh, treatments such as talking therapies and medications. Um, also some negatives of the intervention, for example, that it's more time consuming than taking medication and a few technological issues. But what was also really interesting was that um, people highlighted barriers to uh, general barriers to accessing mental health interventions, um, in particular stigma um, or finding it very difficult to seek help in this particular group and not wanting colleagues to know. Um, and, and one of our pieces of feedback was that the, the kind of anonymity of this very simple digital approach was really valued by this group. And here are some uh, comments from some of our participants. Um, you can see from that first comment there, one of the interesting things that came out for a lot of people is that they actually had, um, they, they didn't expect the intervention to work. They, they had pretty low expectations that this was going to have an effect on their intrusive memories. Um, but it was also really nice to see how simple found, people found it um, uh, to use uh, during the course of the, the study. So a few limitations um, to this first optimization trial that we ran. Um, we didn't use an active control. We obviously had this crossover design where one um, condition received uh, usual care. Um, we also would like to uh, have a look at, at, at follow up over a longer period of time. Here, we our primary outcome was measured at just four weeks. Um, and we also used a shortened version of PCL to assess PTSD symptoms, um, and, and, and it would be nice to use a, a full measure. So in terms of our, our next steps, the next step really will be to, to uh, run an efficacy, efficacy trial. Um, and in this trial, we're, going to, we're using an active control. We are looking at a longer term follow up of symptoms, including the number of intrusive memories over six months. Um, we'll be using a full measure of PTSD symptoms. And we've also opened this trial up to all NHS staff. So beyond intensive care unit staff alone with the knowledge that um, you know, we've got a lot of information about intensive care unit staff, but obviously we know that all NHS staff have been affected by the pandemic. So um, here's some information on how you can find out more about the current trial that we're running. Um, so this trial is open to all NHS staff who've worked with COVID patients during the pandemic. Um, if you know anyone who might be interested in taking part, please pass on these details. Um, just to highlight, it's the study website there on the left where people can find full information about the study, including the information sheet, and um, sign up if they're interested in taking part. So thank you very much for listening, um, and thank you to the other speakers, and of course to Julie for organising the event. Thanks ever so much, Emily and Lally. Um, it's, it's fantastic um, to hear from you and hear, even though I'm working alongside you, I think hearing it presented like that is just quite a novel and an amazing intervention and just so many crossovers uh, with Janice and Di uh, from the Candid trial as well so um just just to say to any audience members pop your questions in the q a function a couple of questions have come in about sharing this afterwards this is being recorded we will be sharing it with you afterwards and it will be available um on social media as well um so we will have this information shared with you afterwards um well i'm delighted to say he's made it neil has joined us Fabulous, uh, you found your room. <laughs> I did. So I'm going to 
hand over to you now, Neil. Hopefully you'll be able to um, share your slides. You've been set up as a presenter, so you shouldn't have any problems there. Do you want to just- It says, it says host disabled participant screen ah, sharing. Okay, so Dara and the, uh, how about that now? How's that go? Yeah, that looks better. That looks good. That's I'm gonna try and find my uh, slides. There they are. Okay, okay. okay. great. Okay, I will. Um, and just to remind me, Julie, sorry to, um, is, is it half an hour including questions or half an hour and then questions? Half an hour and then we've got half an hour for all of us for a Q&A and discussion. Okay, great. Okay, no problems. Um, well, thanks very much indeed for um, asking me to to speak. So uh, I'm uh, and I, I caught the the last uh, bit of the last presentation, which was excellent. So that's that's good news as well. Um, so I'm going to talk um, uh, a bit about uh, moral injury and a bit about um, the study we did with uh, some intensive care staff, um, and uh, and then sort of wrap up with some ideas about how to uh, potentially improve things. Um, those of you who do Twitter, that's a, a Twitter handle. We try and pump out our papers on Twitter when we can. Um, I'm a psychiatrist. Um, I'm ex-military, uh, based at King's, um, served, um, I say, for 23 years in, in the military. And, and I, I do a lot of stuff with the Royal College of Psychiatrists. I'm particularly interested in occupational mental health. Um, and um, with that in mind, we have a large study going uh, at King's College London, um, of 23,000 NHS staff across England which I'll mention a little bit about. And then I'll come on to a, a more focused study, which is um, uh, focused on intensive care staff. Uh, no doubt over the past few years, but reality is for, for a long time that there's been lots of um, exposure to different sorts of stresses, uh, which have gone on uh, for NHS staff, uh, trauma, um, but we also shouldn't forget that you know workload and shift patterns uh, make a huge difference as well and also what goes on at people's home life and there's no doubt that not just in healthcare but uh, across the board that uh, if you've got problems at home you know with sickness with relationship problems with uh, children finances and the like that also impacts upon your um, your ability to, to function well at work and then there's this concept of moral injury uh, so moral injury um, describes the strong uh, reactions that we have when we are exposed to a situation that violates our moral or ethical code. Um, and so these reactions tend to be uh, shame, guilt, anger or disgust um, when we're put in situations uh, where, which are potentially morally injurious. Um, we, we may have no reaction to them. We may have some short term distress. We may become morally injured, which is not a diagnosis, you won't find moral injury in a um, scientific textbook, or you may develop a, a mental a health problem like post-traumatic stress disorder, like depression or the like. Uh, moral injury can occur in various ways. Um, it can occur through uh, what are called acts of commission. Uh, so doing things that, uh, that shouldn't be done. So either that's by yourself or witnessing it in others. Um, you may not do things. You may you may fail to support a colleague who is uh, distressed because you get called off to a, to a, an urgent clinical situation, or you might just to stand by and watch things happen. And then there's these feelings of betrayal, feeling let down by people who really should be looking after you. Uh, and within healthcare settings, that's often uh, your supervisor, you know, the department heads, the the, the the head of nursing, the the, the, the trust, the trust board, you know, whoever that might be, it's people generally who who should be uh, looking out for you. This big study we have going with 25,000 NHS staff uh, across England. Uh, one of the things we've done over the past couple of years is to measure staff's exposure to what are potentially moral injurious events. Um, so these are the situations that violate moral or ethical codes. And they're kind of characterized by this you know, these things should never happen. You know, we should never have been put in this position. Um, and what we've done here is to measure uh, staff's exposure to these events. And these are staff who are exposed to relatively few of them, uh, moderate levels and high exposure to these um, morally injurious events. And we've measured here four different ways of measuring uh, mental health symptoms. Uh, these are common mental health disorders, uh, anxiety disorder symptoms, depression symptoms, and uh, PTSD symptoms. 
And the reason that, that this slide is useful is it shows that it's the group who have the highest exposure to these uh, potentially morally injurious events that have almost a doubling of the rates of potential uh, mental ill health. You know, so if you've got staff who are still talking about, you know, that's not right, this shouldn't have happened, I, I let people down, I, I didn't do the right thing. Those staff are likely to be the ones who are at the highest risk uh, of having uh, mental health problems. When we look in healthcare workers about which aspect uh, of, of potentially moral injurious events um, cause most of the mental health difficulties, it's not commission, uh, it's, uh, it's not omission, it, it's betrayal. It's feeling let down uh, by those who... Um, who, who should be looking out for us. And interestingly, we, we've done a, I'm not going to report here, we've done a more in-depth study, uh, which includes some intensive care staff, but not just intensive care staff. And actually the betrayal most often isn't within the team. It's often not the immediate supervisor who people feel, you know, are, are doing their best. It's often at a much higher level. It's, it's the sort of head of department. It's the, uh, the, the sort of the, the senior executives in the hospital. So it's, it's feeling let down by people in, in senior positions who, who the, the staff that, that we speak to who are experiencing these morally injury symptoms uh, are, are sort of telling us that, that they, they weren't doing the right thing, they weren't looking out for them, that they, they let them down. Um, so going on particularly to um, the study that we did in intensive care staff, um, this was a, a whole group of us, uh, uh, King's College London and also uh, University College London, um, working closely with Kevin Fong and, and a variety of his great team, um, as well as uh, UK Health Security Agency, used to be um, Public Health England. Um, and what we were, what, what we did back at the beginning of the pandemic is to set up a, 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 a process by which we could gather data from, um, from intensive care staff. And we started quite small, um, but it expanded uh, over time uh, to 56 intensive care units across England. Um, and the aim of what we were trying to do was to try and gather data um, very much in line with a, a military process that we had been using the military for years, which is to do something called a unit climate survey. And what unit climate surveys are within military settings uh, is where um, research or mental health staff are able to go out to units and anonymously um, and gather data from units to find out how the unit is functioning, often, often whilst they're deployed. Um, not with the idea of trying to find out who's ill and who's not. This is not screening um, because this is anonymous. Um, and the idea is to very much to find out that at a team-based, unit-based level is how each team is doing. And then you are able to effectively plot all your different teams and see you know, where the teams who are doing really well and the teams who are falling below the average. Not with the intention, again, of beating people with sticks, um, but instead in trying to feed back to the units about how they're doing and try and help them get up towards the, the norm of, uh, of unit functioning. And um, what we did here then is to design a survey tool. Um, it was on a, um, a platform called Lime Survey. Um, and this was an anonymous um, um, tool which uh, took less than five minutes to complete. So we were completely aware that um, you know, staff have got very little time just as the last presenters um, uh, talked about and so therefore we wanted to get the balance between getting sufficient data but also not burdening staff uh, so that they wouldn't complete it. Um, we used a, a measure of uh, depression, um, of anxiety, uh, um, of, of workplace functioning, this is called the work and social adjustment scale, and also sh a short measure of PTSD symptoms. Now it's very hard to to calculate a response rate because um, each unit may have mem very mem large mem numbers of staff but actually on each shift obviously there's obviously a smaller proportion of staff on each shift and what we did the way we distributed this uh, and Kevin Fong those of you who know him you know was able had a very good reach into the intensive care units was to basically get sort of you know champions in each of the units who would on their shifts try and get the staff on those shifts to complete the the, the, the survey and of course, if people were on leave or if they were off for two or three days, they may miss the data gathering period. But our estimations are, we think around a third of staff 
um, completed this on, on each of the units. And certainly when we've looked at the particular figures, it doesn't appear that it was disproportionately, you know, doctors who filled it in or disproportionately younger people or older people. But, you know, this is a limitation to the study. Uh, and we, we can't be sure that we haven't got response bias in there. Um, we produced a paper back uh, at the beginning of 2021, which went into occupational medicine, which sort of gave a, a sort of baseline figure. And this particular study that I'm going to sort of show you the data on now was very much trying to look at the anatomy, the, the psychological anatomy of, of what happens when staff were dealing with uh, one of the peaks of, of COVID. It, it's very much looking, you know, very much as, as a sort of winter peak, which of course the NHS has even when COVID wasn't around. So we had 6,080 surveys completed. Um, you can see here it's mostly by nurses, but also doctors and other healthcare staff. Um, and what we found overall, and I'll show you some graphs in a second because it sort of brings it to life a bit more, is that we were looking particularly at the at the end of, um, in fact, I'll show you this graph now, um, at the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021. So it was that peak of, of COVID at that time. Um, I'll, I'll go back to the results slide in just a second, but the, the graph here is quite useful. So. This is using a, a measure called the PCL6, which is a short measure of PTSD symptoms. And as with all these self-report measures, you can't make a diagnosis from a self-report measure, but there are accepted thresholds, accepted cutoffs. Um, and there are three ways of, of using the PCL6 in terms of the cutoff. So um, this, is, this is with a score of, uh, the PCL6 is scored out of 30. This is with a score of 14, this is a score of 17, and this is a score of 26. And they, these are kind of different ways of, of, of looking at PTSD or probable PTSD. And the key thing here is you can see that this was um, July uh, 2020. Uh, this is January 2021, it goes out to July 2021. That for PTSD symptoms, whichever threshold you use, there was this kind of pattern of things were getting better from that first wave of COVID. And then the second wave uh, sort of hit. And as it did, so did the increased reporting of symptoms. So more trauma symptoms are reported, whatever threshold you look. And then as things got better, those symptoms began to go down again. So I think this is, this is really interesting for lots of reasons, because it, it's perhaps not surprising that staff were, were more traumatized when the work was more difficult and morally injurious and challenging. But what is interesting is there is natural recovery here that, that goes on and, and pretty much not quite, but it's sort of coming back down to the same levels as they were before the peak started. So the anatomy here is that as, as workload and patient load and challenge goes up, um, so do symptom reporting, and then that symptom reporting comes down uh, quite naturally over time. So, go, uh, so, so overall, in terms of the numbers, um, we use this uh, threshold of what we call any mental health disorder. And this was depression, anxiety disorder, or PTSD. And we found, you know, very high levels here, as you can see, you know, with, with you know, around 50% beforehand going up to nearly two thirds and sort of just less than 50% afterwards. Um, we did these surveys every six weeks or so. Um, and um, what we found overall was you're more likely at any time point to uh, report a mental health disorder in an intensive care setting. If you were younger, you were less experienced, and if you were nursing rather than uh, doctors or other healthcare staff. But one of the things we didn't find is it wasn't related to redeployment, because there was this uh, idea or this worry that staff brought into intensive care settings to supplement normal uh, staff in there might be at increased risk. Um, and, and we certainly didn't find that. But, and, and that finding by itself is, is rather interesting because um, if you look at other settings in healthcare and also in other occupational groups, we know that uh, repeatedly we find that staff who are put into novel situations, you know, who are, to be fair, less experienced in that setting are more likely to have difficulties. Whereas in intensive care, we, we didn't really find that. And, you know, that can lead us perhaps to speculate that maybe those staff didn't do the most traumatic roles. Maybe the intensive care staff um, who were usually based there were, were more likely to take on the, 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 the sort of more challenging roles and the other roles were, were done by these sort of redeployed staff. What was um, 
particularly interesting about this this study that we looked in is that during and after the winter surge, over 50% of participants using the work and social adjustment scale met the criteria for, for what we would say was functional impairment. Now, again, all these studies have limitations. The work and social adjustment scale is a really good measure, but it's really designed for people who um, come to a healthcare clinic or who come to a mental health care clinic. And so it's designed, um, it's a very brief five item question questionnaire, but it's really designed for people who may have um, a mental health disorder or a health disorder in the first place. Um, but the fact is over 50% appear to be impaired on this scale. And it was more likely, unsurprisingly, if you had a probable mental health disorder, then you were more likely to be functionally impaired. And of course, this then has great implications because if we really are saying that 50% of people working in intensive care um, during a, a high pressure surge, which goes on, um, were functionally impaired, then not only is that bad news for their mental health uh, and, and, their, and the likelihood that they'll stay doing that role, but also in terms of patient care, and um, one of the things we are working on, but is much more difficult to do, is to try and link um, patient outcomes on uh, these units with uh, functional impairment. Because our our suspicion is is that if you um, are functionally impaired, you have high levels of functional impairment in your unit, then you are more likely to get poor patient outcomes. And that's not a good thing, but it's a very useful thing in terms of making the argument for why improved mental health support is not just a good thing because it's a nice to do, but is a good thing to do because it gives us better patient outcomes, which um, is good not just for patients, but it's also good because it reduces the pressure uh, of hospitals having to deal with you know un unwanted and untoward events, uh, which in themselves are a cause of mental health problems. Um, so that so that's the PTSD measure. Just to show you, this is the anxiety disorder measure. And again, you can see a very similar pattern depending on whether you take severe or, or moderate symptoms. Um, and if I put the depression one up, I'm, I, it would be the same. I just want to put up here this one, though. So this one um, is a, a measure of suicidal ideation. And so one question in the PHQ-9 questionnaire, question nine, um, asks about people's intention to either harm themselves or end their life or their thoughts about it over the last two weeks. So again, just taking here before the, the winter surge, you can see, you know, large percentages, you know, for, for suicidal thoughts, um, uh, 40, about 14 down, you know, between 12 and 14% of staff are thinking in the last two weeks about, I'd rather not be here. Those that goes up, you know, it's not going up massively, but it goes up to 16%. And then it comes down again, but it doesn't come down quite as far as as, it, as the other measures, which are sort of almost came back to, to the baseline. And what this might well work, be representing is not just what happened in the winter peak, but also about the prolonged nature of the pandemic. And I think this is great relevance for how the NHS is at the moment with the prolonged nature of the difficulties it's been facing, is that one of the impacts is upon suicidal thoughts now the good news if there is good news about this is you know most people who have suicidal thoughts or suicidal um uh, sort of beliefs don't go on to end their life through suicide but of course some do um and i think this is a a potentially worrying finding because what we don't have here unfortunately is uh, ongoing data about where this level of suicidal thoughts are uh, in intensive care staff right now um, the survey sort of finished at the, the, the middle of last year. Um, but what this would suggest is any prolonged challenging crisis is likely to have, you know, a small but significant increase in suicidal thoughts, which, which clearly, you know, is, is a very bad outcome. Um, I just want to move on now, having given you that sort of data, into just a little bit about the sorts of things that, that may well help to improve um, the mental health of healthcare workers. One thing is, of course, um, social support about having good uh, team cohesion. And uh, although I'm a psychiatrist and, and, and not a, an intensivist, uh, my understanding is that, you know, intensive care settings actually are pretty good uh, when it comes to sort of forming and, and working as teams. Um, this is military data from, from some years ago now, but when we asked uh, military personnel who they spoke to about their sort of mental well-being, 
um, actually 97% said that they were likely to speak to people who were just like them, who wore the same uniform, who had the same experiences, who spoke the same language. And although many bits of the military, and indeed now many bits of the uh, NHS, have well-being and mental health support um, processes, you could probably be aware, at least at the moment, we don't know for how long, there are um, over 40 well-being hubs across uh, the NHS. Most people don't speak to medical or welfare services. Most people prefer to speak to, to their colleagues, uh, people who are just like them. Very good evidence um, from military and also now from our uh, NHS check um, study as well that actually the most important relationship in the workplace from a mental health point of view is actually the relationship you have with your immediate supervisor. Um, so this was a military study we did some years ago. Uh, we're just uh, cracking our data now at the NHS to, 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 to show and it's showing a similar uh, um, sort of picture, although we haven't yet published that is that these were British troops in 2010 in Afghanistan. Uh, just less than 3% of those troops appear to have PTSD. We also asked the troops about their perception of their immediate supervisor and, and, and whether they were supportive and whether they treated people fairly and, and, and so forth. These are troops who felt the immediate supervisor was, um, was good, you know, was able to support them and looked after them. These are troops who felt their immediate supervisor were poor there is a tenfold difference in the rates of probable PTSD between uh, having a supervisor who you feel is looking out for you versus one who isn't. So this is cross-sectional data. It doesn't, it tells us association, it doesn't tell us causation, but this is a very strong uh, impact in terms of the uh, potential for supervisor, uh, uh, staff member relationships to have an impact on mental health. This was a randomized control trial done in Australia with firefighters where they trained up fire station managers how to have what we call a psychologically savvy conversation with staff. Um, this is a randomized control trial, so it was a high quality trial. Um, and what they did here was to measure sickness absence in the six months before and after the, uh, the intervention. Uh, for those of you who don't know firefighters in New South Wales, they're probably not the most psychologically minded individuals you might meet. And they found that for every pound invested in uh, that training package, it was published in a UK journal, which is why it's in thousands of dollars, um, they saved 10 pounds in sickness absence over the following six months. So again, there's a 90% reduction in sickness uh, costs um, associated with mental health as a result of this training. So both those two pieces of evidence, and there's plenty more as well, really support the fact that actually getting supervisors to feel confident to speak about um, mental health difficulties with their staff is likely to have a really big effect. So we did a very simple study um, back at the sort of beginning of the pandemic where we put in place a one hour training package called REACT, uh, which we um, I, I was running the mental health strategy at the London Nightingale Hospital when that started. Obviously, it didn't go too far, thankfully. Um, and we put in place this, this brief training, which initially was face to face and then switched on to Zoom, lasted for one hour. So it was very you know, simple, very bite sized. And what we did was train up people how to have a template to have one of these uh, psychologically savvy conversations. We published this in Occupational Medicine. It was a, an evaluation. It wasn't a randomized controlled trial. But what we showed is before uh, getting that one hour training package, over half of the supervisors didn't feel confident to identify, speak with and uh, support staff who might have mental health problems. One month afterwards, nearly 85% felt confident. So this was an increase in staff, uh, super, super supervisors confidence to speak about uh, mental health difficulties as a result of a one hour bite-sized training package, uh, which is likely to have benefit effects. We know that peer support can make a, a big difference. Um, peer support is um, one of the ways you can do it is through the TRIM program, the Trauma Risk Management program. There are plenty of other uh, programs out there that, that, that might do similarly. Um, this is a peer support process that's been going for a long time in the military, but also now used by over 50 NHS trusts, but also emergency services and diplomats and media professionals and the like. It's not training up um, staff to be counsellors or, or to do psychotherapy because that's not what it's about. It's a couple of days training people up to understand about trauma and to be a peer supporter able to listen to a colleague and able to identify if they've got a problem and get that person uh, pushed through to get professional help. And um, it, yeah, this is this is not penicillin for trauma, but we've now got 14 published papers 
uh, on Trim, which shows it's a credible way of, of providing sort of short term support and to do what NICE call active, uh, active monitoring. Um, so this is a slide from the NICE PTSD guidelines. Um, what NICE are very clear we should not be doing is what's called psychological debriefing. Um, so much as mental health professionals have a role to play in supporting staff, there is no evidence at all that um, bringing in mental health professionals into a team who have been through traumatic times is likely to help. And actually, on balance, it's likely to do harm, which is why NICE say don't do it. Instead, what they say is you should actively monitor staff, so keep an eye on them over time. And then the last bit I just want to talk about here about what you should do when staff are having a tough time is about this concept called PIES, um, which again comes from the military. But the concept here is that if you've got a supervisor who can support staff properly, uh, then that's likely to make a difference. The question is, what does that support look like? And so um, this was a study done in the Israeli military, actually, where they did a 20 year follow up study. You don't get many of those of um, Israeli troops who had developed acute stress reactions uh, whilst um, in a conflict. And then um, they got the PIES principles uh, applied and they found the more of these principles applied, the better people's outcome was 20 years later on. So P stands for proximity which basically means if you've got someone who's having a tough time, you don't just send them home. Instead, you try and support them more. You maybe change their role around a little bit, um, but you keep them uh, you know, within the team as much as you can. Don't let people become very unwell and highly distressed before you intervene. Nipping things in the bud is a good idea. Expectancy says that actually most people who go through traumatic situations um, will develop some symptoms, um, but actually mostly those symptoms will recover by themselves. Um, and then simplicity is if you've got people who have got uh, anxiety or, or, or other sort of distress symptoms, um, then actually it's, it's quite often a, possible to resolve those without the need for any mental health interventions. So, for instance, if you had a member of staff who wasn't sure about a particular procedure and was very anxious about it or was worried they were going to do it wrong, they don't need 10 sessions of cognitive behavioural therapy. They need to speak to uh, someone who can do that technique to mentor or help them to do that technique better simple things make a big difference and just to kind of lead on a on a sort of more positive note um there is this topic that you may or may not have heard about called post-traumatic growth and what post-traumatic growth describes is going through a psychologically challenging time maybe becoming distressed or maybe not but then experiencing growth uh, and by growth in this sense we mean that that one's ability to cope with future adversity is increased um, and so actually, you know, given what has gone on over the last few years and clearly is still to some extent going on now, is that we, if we believe the Daily Mail, we, we often believe that, you know, we're doomed, the, the, it's the end of all time and things are only going to be bad, uh, worse in the future. That may well not be true. It, it may well be that actually, if you go through this really challenging, difficult time, you may come out of it. Um, as uh, more psychologically robust uh, as a result of it, you know, which which is likely to be good news. So what can you do about this? Well, you can say proper thank yous. You can give people information uh, about uh, how to do their job properly, about where to get help. You could not just uh, keep pushing people to do lots and lots and lots of tasks without giving them time off. And then going back to that moral injury piece, we think, and this is still a uh, work in progress in terms of, of research, which we're doing at the moment, is that what is useful here is not just to talk about what went right and what went wrong, but is to talk about um, the impact of the work. And that's um, ideally done again by a supervisor talking about and encouraging people to talk about the fact is that that, that things are hard. You know, we're not trying to say gloss it over and give that nice kind of, oh, no, it's all OK, it'll be better tomorrow, because actually it won't. Uh, but actually, even if we're not in the same boat, we're absolutely in the same storm is that everybody is experiencing this to some degree. And because people often don't talk about the impact, the emotional and psychological and cognitive impact of, of these events, people feel that it's just them, that it's someone else's fault, that if only this person over here who did, did their job properly, that wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be like this. Or if only I had done things differently, then, 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 then things would have been better. And the idea here is at a team level to try and create a meaningful narrative and that's a story which doesn't end up with it all being my fault or all ending being the boss's fault but it ends up instead with us understanding that we're in it together when we're doing the best in in difficult circumstances and then um you know i've mentioned about supervisors already but just to say in terms of 
what should happen if people unfortunately do become unwell is is actually uh, we need to have access to uh, mental health care which takes into account people's ability to work and unfortunately one of the downsides of of some of the standard health care that goes on you know provided excellently by the nhs is it's all about improving people's symptoms and and that's fine but certainly in an occupational context particularly in healthcare where the work is going to continue to be challenging we need to make sure that the mental health care that's provided um, has returned to or stay at work as an important treatment outcome. And the evidence is that where you do that, where you specifically talk about work and how to stay at work or return to work, then you're more likely to get people back to work. Um, and there, there are lots of, uh, of approaches that, that can help with this, but, but it's important that you don't just say, well, let's just get people better. It's let get them better and get them back to work because that's good for everybody. So overall, um, I've mentioned the data in the intensive care staff in terms of the Interventions, though, we shouldn't over-medicalise things. We should try and nip things in the bud. We want to, to have good supportive teams and good supportive relationships with our managers. And we want to try and aim for post-traumatic growth. And we, if we do that properly, then actually we could come out of this as a stronger, uh, more effective organisation. So that's me. And I'll just see if I can stop sharing. Uh, you'll stop sharing. Great. Thank you. Fabulous. Thanks, Neil. I'm perfectly to time as well. Well done. Um, thank you to all of you for really fantastic talks. I would just encourage people in the audience to start typing questions in the Q&A. I can see one's popped up already. I have a page full for you as well if other people don't ask questions. But I think the one big reflection hearing three very different talks from three different angles is that what runs through it is that that last point you make about not over medicalizing and not being so focused on let's let's give diagnosis and think about that and think more about how do people function? How do people do this very challenging work and different ways of thinking about the systemic factors kind of focusing in on specific elements of, of the symptoms but also thinking very importantly for, for a person who popped something in the chat earlier from what you said neil actually not going straight to therapy or debriefing first but actually thinking about those those supervisors and those systems around people so that's that's enough buffer for me to uh, give people time to start typing in questions um so uh oh okay someone's actually given us a, a link so i'm not sure what that's about but we'll have a look at that um later um but uh anya i think that's how to pronounce her name says the research presented today has been fascinating and has inspired the research i'm currently undertaking as part of my clinical psychology doctorate so we have the trainee psychologists online this morning welcome i'm currently recruiting for my study <laughs> So uh, looking at ICU um, and critical care professionals and their exposure to morally injurious events during COVID-19. Um, so that's what the link is for. So a little bit of plugging there for Anya, if we've got anyone in the audience um, who wishes to uh, follow that link, you can look at the Q&A. Um, Anya, you might want to post that link in the chat because I'm not convince the audience can see the Q&A. It's fine to put that in the chat. Um, while we're waiting for other questions, I wondered, I, I appreciate Neil, you didn't catch all of the other um, presentations, but I wondered if um, you as a panel wish to ask questions of each other. And just to say, Diane, your camera is off or your webcam is down. Uh, if you want to come back to us, there we go. Anyone want to trick us off? Jam, go for it. I think I'd like to say just how much synergy there was across all three presentations. Um, the themes are clearly emerging uh, around the ongoing distress that many practitioners still have, but the issues around some of the work you've just presented, Neil, around managerial support um, and relationships with supervisors. Now, we didn't present that data. But that came out very strongly uh, in our study. So I think the evidence base is really developing. Yeah, absolutely. 
if, if I just jump back in, uh, and, and thanks for that, that, that's good to hear. I, I think the real challenge here is that, it, and this is not just with the NHS, it's with lots of organisations, is that when people are promoted or apply and get um, successful into a supervisory position, the question is what, what skills do we provide them with? Or do we just make the assumption that because you were you know, a good intensive care you know, junior nurse, you're being a good intensive care senior nurse. And I think I think rather than make that assumption, what we need to do is to provide sets of tools, you know, or to have um, promotion uh, prospects, you know, based upon having the right experience to lead, not just the right experience to be a technical specialist. Yeah, I agree. And, and within our study, we had examples of extremely good uh, leadership and management. Uh, and managers were under incredible pressure. So it's you know, it's not a bit of blame, it's, it's uh, the flight time recognises that also. I just also wanted to highlight, I, I know from a, a more detailed discussion that we've had Janice and Di, um, but it was presented there in your data, that link between supervisor experience and intention to leave as well was highlighted in your data. So to just highlight that, I guess it's possible we may have uh, some of what's called PNAs in the audience. So this is something that's been a big driver in NHS England. It's now going for Nation, which is the professional nurse advocate which in many ways, just thinking about the two that have trained up to, to join me on um, my unit in South Wales, actually refers back to that psychologically savvy conversations, Neil, and actually that narrative, that making sense and talking about the work that we do. Um, so that PNA initiative is out there. But I, I think the other thing I would add in is the time to then have those conversations isn't always factored in. And I think that's that's a big problem in healthcare and elsewhere, isn't it? Any other comments or questions? I'd completely agree. And one of the other fabulous things about PNAs is, of course, when it comes to people thinking, you know, do I be honest with my boss or no? I might have a great boss, but they're still going to be, you know, looking at my reports. Is the PNA is outside of that kind of lines of management? And that, that can make them a very attractive person uh, to speak to. Um, and, uh, and and what we see, again, inside and outside of healthcare is you have some occupational health departments who are seen as being fabulous and well trusted and I'll speak to them and you have other occupational health departments who are seen as the enemy that you don't want to get referred to occupational health because if you do that's the, um, the, 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 the term used by the US Marines is very good that they call mental health professionals wizards. And they call them wizards because when someone goes to see them, they just get they disappear. No one ever sees them again. They go away. Um, and what you don't what you want the PNAs and you want you know all the resources to be seen as supportive, not as you know the kiss of death to your career or your promotion prospects. And 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 that's about you know managing um, what they do and what their role is quite carefully. And I find time and time again, I, I don't know um, whether Emily and Janice find similarly is that. Um, there is often a desire by senior management to know, you know, who's got a problem, you know, where are the problems, and they want to know these things, but there is a cost to knowing those things as well. And being professionals, we need to be sit in that middle ground of, you know, of judging when to divulge a risk and, and when actually it's our job to hold it. Absolutely. Um, Lally, you unmuted. Did you want to come in there? Yes, no, I mean, I, I was uh, I was kind of interested also in a sort of another thread moving away a bit from the, the kind of supervisor relationship, more thinking about um, the kind of functioning aspect that we all touched on and how critical that is. And, and what I actually really have liked about the set of talk is that, we're, you know, we're talking about the staff and obviously in the NHS, the focus is often on patient outcomes um, and and you know, thinking about, we're particularly interested in how, um, you know, in, in our case, the particular symptom of intrusive memories can impact people's functioning, and then how that might then affect how people can uh, do their jobs. You know, we talking to our, our participants, we often hear that people actually avoid going into work because of the sorts of symptoms they're experiencing or experiences they had, or that they find particular procedures really difficult. So we know that functioning is affected. And I was really um, interested, Neil, you were saying that you're, this is something you're hoping to look at more, how, the kind of link between the functioning and actually patient outcomes and whether you've got sort of plans, plans for that, because that's something from an NHS perspective that's really valuable. 
Yeah, so I, I'm now treading into ground that I, I don't know well because I'm a psychiatrist, but certainly speaking from Kevin, there, there's ICNARC, who you will know better than me, um, track patient outcomes. And so actually, if we are able to link our mental health data, which we have at team-based level, with the outcomes, uh, you know, poor outcomes or unfortunate outcomes, again, at team-based level, what we think we will find and what would be very useful to show is that actually, you know, where group mental health is worse, then actually the patient outcomes are, are worse, because that would then be a very strong argument for trying to support. And actually, you know, it's not just about you know, mental health training, the like, it's also about the right staffing levels, it's about, you know, the access to right sort of, you know, support in terms of car parking and food and all those things. We, we shouldn't, you know, over, overly jump onto mental health interventions. But actually, if we can show the, that link between the two things, that I think would make a strong argument to trust boards. And, and just to say, uh, for anyone who doesn't know what ICNARC data is in the uh, in the audience, most people were from ICU, so they should do. Um, they're, they're, it's a national um, outcomes database for critical care. There was actually a North Wales study on that over the pandemic that looked at staffing levels and outcomes, and there's a very clear uh, connection, as you say. I just want to, with that in mind, I just want to read out the comment uh, from someone who's moved into it as sort of senior nurse position I think uh, they haven't fully said but but given the the band they've given I think they are fully um, at that level and they sort of said I've just moved to a unit that has huge issues with retention vacancy rates um, but actually you know the systemic factors are so key and our exit interviews say much the same not feeling valued exhausted from the work knowing it's not getting better and I'm realistically trying to strategize where to go next Next, um, they have it integrated psychology links to occupational health. Uh, they have PNAs in the role, and there they're looking at peer support as well. So looking at all of those things together, um, and, and uh, they say any advice would be great. And uh, my advice would be yes, do all of those things um, <laughs> and more. Really, I, I think a, a key thing within that, I think, is actually how staff feel valued and enabled to do the job well. So just linking back to the candid um, data about the organisations that focus on quality, even if stretched, even if under duress, actually, if there's that sense, and again, that can come from good leadership as well, that message of focusing on quality. Do you want to maybe say more to that? Yeah, well, certainly that came through strongly in both the data that we collected, and we've done a number of stakeholder events to share the findings with the, the participants. And, and overwhelmingly, the sense of being able to deliver quality care uh, and how the organisation values them uh, came, has come through incredibly strongly. Uh, so it's how you're treated, how you're valued. Uh, and, and sometimes that doesn't take an awful lot to make people feel valued uh, and treated well. Guy, do you have anything else to add? No, I think that, I mean, I, I agree with that, Janice, and, and what everyone's saying, that we we did get a, we did get a sense that it was, though, it, it, it was factors like that. How, you know, what makes a person feel valued? What makes them feel like they're being treated like a professional in their, in their, in their role? Um, and I think some of that went missing during the pandemic, and we can see that in our data. So things like learning opportunities, I think we were quite surprised that that was a really big predictor uh, of outcomes. But again, it's, a, it's an indicator that the organisation values that preferred person in their professional roles. And of course, Neil, our study was, you know, we, were just, we were looking at nurses um, only. So I think, but I, I'd make a little comment just listening to the discussion. And I, I agree absolutely with what, what everyone's saying around, it's important to show that there's a relationship with patient outcomes, but just listening that, and from someone that's actually quite new, I've, I've never worked on a, a, an intensive care project before, never worked looking at nurses as a staff group. But to me, the idea that that, is more important, but is somehow that's got more value than what's the impact on the staff? You know, the value of that says something about the culture, I think, of, of the NHS 
that actually you need to be able to demonstrate that there's an impact on patient outcomes. The impact is on the staff. And I, I recognize that that's important, but somehow that says something about the, the culture that's quite, there's been quite an interesting learning experience for me working on this project. I think for me, I feel a sadness in relation to that. Yeah. Can I just can I just j can I jump in there? So the, the the interesting thing there is, I whilst I completely agree with you that you know we should be making more of a focus on staff well being and and uh, and the like. The fact is, every other organisation I've worked with lots has exactly the same difficulties. And sometimes it's easy to see the NHS as being this terribly bad, badly led, you know, bad 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 morale. And I'm not saying that's not true to some degree, but I can tell you if I go to work with big organizations who are the media or emergency services, we see the same thing. You know, managers and people in senior positions are interested in well-being to some degree, but they get judged on what's the output, you know, whether I make widgets, whether I, you know, arrest criminals or whatever it is. And so I think actually it's up to us as healthcare professionals to try and sell our our interventions in in a way that is appealing uh, to to the seniors and and this idea of return on investment, which I know sounds terrible, doesn't it? But actually it, it's a stark fact of life. And I always think about it in and sorry to whistle on too much, but in in four levels. You know, one of it is what you're talking about, which is the moral reason we should do the right thing and look after staff. But actually, the things that persuade people far more commonly are the economic argument, you know, in terms of producing the output, the reputational bit, because you don't want to appear in the Daily Mail. And also you want to have a good reputation because you want staff to come to you and not to the trust next door. And actually, the, the strongest driver of all is the legal argument, because actually lawyers and courts you know, end up causing an awful lot of anxiety and costing an awful lot of money. And I always used to say when I was in the military, you know, if, if I could save one helicopter pilot a year, then I covered my salary easily. I could sit back and do nothing for the whole time. Um, and so I, I do think that we have to make the arguments in a way that is attractive to, to, to the boards, not, although I agree with you morally, we should be more interested. Oh, thanks, Neil. Emily, you unmuted, come on in. Oh, I just wanted to say thank you to all my co-panelists. This has been so fantastic hearing the work and just thinking about it. Um, just picking up on the same thread here, and Diana, um, I mean, the, the data that we presented today was very much the kind of mathsy Bayesian RCT results, but we're very respectful of the more lived experience qualitative work our colleagues in Nottingham have done. And what I'm curious about is maybe a space going forwards, because perhaps this, this, uh, this thing on patient outcomes is, is very important to reflect on, because one of the barriers of staff taking up care for themselves was that this, in, what we noticed working in intensive care, this incredible compassion and focus on the patient at the expense of themselves. So from a psychological point of view, I think it is worth really reflecting on, um, and very, I mean, Julie's the, the expert here as well, like how to strike that balance of, of I guess, return on investment, but also how to look after people whose very raison d'etre, what we've been so ex impressed by is this care of the focus on patients rather than themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a difficult one. And I, I, I guess I would say that's the kind of conversation I have on a day to day basis. Um, and I think, unfortunately, you often take that approach of um, you have to be the right resource to your patient. And actually to, to come back to that's the only way to get many healthcare staff to look after themselves is to, to focus on well, you need to be functioning to do this job well, actually. <laughs> But in that case, this, this, this data that Neil will have it could, could, could really help contribute to this debate by highlighting some of that and, yeah. and trying to incentivize both, not you talked about seniors, Neil, but also trying to think about how, how maybe going back to your study as well, the, the impact of functioning is, like if you look after yourself, you can help improve functioning for yourself and others. Um, and maybe that's part of a wider narrative for, for all of us to learn about in the, in the years going forward. I, I agree. And actually, one of the things about functioning is, yes, we absolutely want to do the best for our, our patients, but also where we do less than the best for our patients, that also impacts upon our mental health. So actually functioning well is actually psychologically protective. It's that's that circle. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to kind of make that link and link to a question that's in there about resilience training. Um, and I, I guess what I was particularly interested in terms of going back to the moral uh, distress injury research of yours, um, uh, Neil, is how it relates to my day to day practice, which is the betrayal 
arm of it and almost that sense of the organization isn't looking after us which really links in with the gains work as well around organizational attitudes and um there's a, a lovely nurse researcher intensive care nurse researcher called um una st edger and uh, she introduced me to the concept of moral outrage and that is a way of describing this betrayal and i i guess i wonder in in that link my personal view of resilience training is that there can be some really good ways in which we can highlight and enable people's own drivers and their own self-care and the, their own sort of pitfalls in in the way that they may not do that in terms of overworking typical one for nursing staff um, in terms of that self-criticalness etc but also we need to frame that in the context of the organizational attitude towards looking out for people and i make that moral outrage link with the, the that sense of that wider organization doesn't care about us um, and they've just sent us out without a care and without any kind of uh, ongoing reward or value, you know, linked to current strikes. And the, there are new strikes today, aren't there? So resilience, discuss. So I think my my quick take on it is, I, I think we talked about this already, Julie, to some degree, is that the, the danger with the word resilience is that if you see it as an individual trait, then there is this element of people feeling blamed or a failure because I, I am not resilient enough or you should be more resilient. Uh, I think that actually in 99.9% .9 of the NHS, we work in teams, we work in groups of people, and therefore it is much, much more helpful to think about resilient teams than it is to think about resilient individuals. And resilient teams have, yes, they might have a, you know, a mindfulness training package or they have a yoga program or whatever. There's no problem in that. But more importantly, we have good relationships. You know, we talk about how difficult the work is. You know, we provide the right support and we've got each other's back. And, you know, the evidence is, again, going back to the military setting, is when we're looking at, at, at teams who are working there, it's the teams who, who support each other the best, who perform the best. Um, and uh, that performance is linked with mental health. So I think we need to stop thinking about resilience just at an individual level. In fact, the individual level is probably not that important at all when you think about it at a team level. And also to some degree, if we can, much more difficult at an organizational level, how resilient. And that basically means instead of having the chief executive, you know, doing a, a, a questions and answer town hall where they give a nice positive spin on everything being fine and any questions are asked comes with a politically, you know, indecipherable answer. You know, it's about people being honest. Because um, uh, I think that's more likely to create uh, trust and, and to sort of decrease some of that betrayal. I had muted myself. I'd agree with that. Emily, come on in. Yeah, just to completely um, back, agree with, with Neil, but I'm also just wondering, uh, slightly just pulling back a little bit about thinking when we're talking though about the, I think resilience is really important. The word sustainability might be a word that we're going to be thinking about more in the, in the next 10 years. Um, but also just the, to be thinking about what can we do? Like there's clearly a problem. So maybe we need interventions at all levels. Maybe some interventions will need to be at an individual level. Some interventions will need to be at a team level. Some interventions will need to be at an organisational level. I think it's quite difficult in this field. It's very easy to just focus on one level and, and we sort of need a map of, of the bigger picture and how can the organisation support at all those different levels. Um, and I'm thinking here very much like a mental health scientist rather than one profession. Like we're interested in, in, in treatments that can, can work at, at a bigger picture and that's what's gone wrong in protecting mental health and that's what's desperately needed over the next 10 years yeah yeah and I, I think what I would say from just trying to do this on on the shop floor what you find is actually at all systems of of management the headspace uh, the bandwidth to actually think in those multiple levels has been under strain and pressure and I think yeah. what can happen sometimes is that they can catch on one idea and run with it at the expense of others so it's being able to hold all of these things in mind isn't it and also if i can just go back to the study data and obviously it's a working hypothesis i think if one starts to think about this mechanistically and i'm just going to be the nerdy scientist for a second because what we do in other areas of medicine we try and target a mechanism and see the effects on other things and i think that's why this joined up symposium you pulled together is so important julie because 
we we put a, put some of the work function data in more because we knew what Janice and Dan were talking about, having read their paper. But maybe sometimes a problem in one area can be affected by doing something in another area, just like they can in any area of medicine. So we also need to be savvy about when we've got these kind of concentric circles of levels of explanation about mental well-being. Actually, maybe doing an individual thing can help an organizational thing, or vice versa. And that's why we're sort of interested in even when sometimes you take this is just an example of millions of things that could be done. But in our case, we were really curious and, and wanted to go through the hypothesis of why helping people with their burden of intrusive memories of the worst shift, for example, might actually help their functioning a month later, uh, because you would hypothesize perhaps that to be the case. So, so these little science details might be really interesting. Yes. And just just to link there back back to Gaines, just to answer one of the questions that came up, there's a particular reason why we haven't mentioned the detail of the intervention, and that's because it's ongoing and we don't want to unblind people. So just just to say that um, I'm I'm aware of time and I've saved one question to last, really. Um, I will read it in full. It says with the current context of reduced resources, ongoing strikes and the impact this has more widely on the quality of care uh, we have a sense um, do we have a sense of how this might continue to um, impact the well-being of staff and their intentions to leave the nhs many points raised across the studies suggest the prospects are quite bleak at the moment any thoughts or reflections would be great to hear on what the future might look like going forward um i'm going to go around kind of study by study. Janice and Diane, any thoughts on that? I don't think the future is completely bleak. I think what we found, um, I mean, our data are quite stark and I think quite upsetting in many instances that both the qualitative data and the snapshots of words that, that we presented, I found quite emotional. But when we've gone round to the stakeholder groups or to health boards to present this, all we've seen are committed staff, committed to quality and committed to developing their profession. And I think if you've got that, it shouldn't take too much to um, harness it and, and take it forward because the staff are still there and they're still committed to, to their, their uh, professions. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. I think, I mean, you can be, it can get a bit doomy and gloomy on it, but I think the, the the level of commitment from staff is it is amazing. But I think, you know, Neil said something earlier about staff can be promoted, and then they're not given the tools that they need for that. What comes with that promoted role? And I think certainly thinking about the candid data, both the both the quants and the quality data. I think that's a really interesting and available opportunity, actually, for the for the NHS to support staff in a way that might not be that resource in, intensive and would be would have sustainability within it. I think. Thank you, Emily and Lally. Um, thanks for the question, Julia. Just two points. The first one is a. A as a psychological scientist, one of the things I'm really interested in is this vision of the future, because what we know from brain science is that the same bits of your brain that takes in traumatic images and worst events is the same bit of your brain that does images of the future. So if you've had a lot of bad things and that's taken that up, it's actually harder to be optimistic and go forwards. So I do think that creating a narrative about the future and freeing up that space by address addressing the bad things will be really important systemically for creating a visual optimistic future as it were um the second thing i wanted to say is about the future is i think we have to approach mental well-being in a more joined up way between professions and more collaboratively this is not a horse race we need lots of different approaches there is no one size fits all and just really welcome the start of what i hope is many discussions with you it's been fabulous working with the ics it's so important to learn from you and and, and meeting all of you today, talking across different levels and, and trying to work together more rather than have these sort of rival professions, which I think's kept mental health back. And that shouldn't be the case, particularly for staff. And Lally? 
Yes, just I, I just wanted to echo really a, a sort of more optimistic prospect for the future. And, and obviously, you know, the, this set of talks has been brought together on, on the back of COVID really and the impact of COVID on and the pandemic on, on, on staff well-being. But obviously, you know, we saw from Janice and Diane's talk that job demands on NHS staff have always been incredibly high. They've always been faced with, you know, a, a lot of you know, a great deal of challenges and adversity in their job. Um, and actually, I think what is fantastic is this really sort of a vision of a positive future where we're all coming together to tackle this problem, which was which was pre-existing. Um, but now I think we've actually got a chance of making something of it. Thanks, Lally. And then Neil. Um, so just a couple of things to me. I mean, one is a study we did some years ago after the London bombings. Um, was is relevant so we did a study about 10 days after the first london bombings and we asked uh, londoners we did a telephone survey about their intentions and their intentions were i'm going to move out of london i'm not going to use the tube i'm not going to use the bus and then we did a further follow-up six months later where we also looked at the footfall data the data they used and guess what people hadn't left london they hadn't cycled more they hadn't used the bus they were busier and and so that's actually People's intentions are really important and you shouldn't ignore them, but they also aren't the prediction of the future in an accurate way. And we can change that future by um, by making sure that we say that the cavalry are coming. The cavalry don't need to be here today, but there has to be this element of hope. So whether that's more staff, whether it's better well-being, as long as there's over the horizon, that we believe the cavalry are coming and eventually some of the cavalry at least do come, then I believe it can be more positive. But um, just you know, negative story after negative story and promises that aren't kept are, are not going to be the way to, to create a positive future. Thank you. Um, I just want to end by saying thanks to all of you for one coming and taking the time to share your research with myself and the audience today and that will be shared wider through the recording Two for doing the research in the first instance, actually, and taking this from so many different angles. But three, I think importantly for that message of hope uh, for our audience, this is complicated, but there is a way through if we work together. And I think ultimately, I think that that message of our commitment as healthcare professionals, both us around the room, but you guys out there listening in the audience, um, that we will find a way through this. And I just want to leave you with that thought and thank you all for attending this morning. So I'll stop the recording and say farewell to our audience. Thanks, Thanks Julie. Thanks very much indeed. Bye-bye.